Good morning, and welcome back to another Teaching Sound Doctrine Bible class. As always, we want you to get comfortable, pull out a pencil and paper, open your Bibles, and come study God's Word with us. Of course, make sure you take notes, because I don't always read the scriptures. I oftentimes, oftentimes just give you the reference, and I want you all to know that uh, I appreciate you being here. And uh, it's my hope and prayer that you'll get something out of these studies. Today, in fact, that's what we're going to look at. Study. How we study the Bible and why and so forth. And we're going to go from there. Now, we're told in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the uh, word of truth. Now, that's what Paul told Timothy, and that's what we should be doing. You know, we would, uh, I don't think there'd be any denominations anywhere on the face of the earth if this injunction by Paul to Timothy had been closely followed all along. You see, division doesn't, uh, uh, it, it, it does riot, and it and it has its uh, origin in the Bible. It comes as a result of a man's failure to accept or to rightly divide the word of truth. You see, you know, it's not talking just about the Old Testament and the New Testament. Rightly dividing God's word is accepting it for what it says, keeping it within the context, and applying it to your life in a daily manner. Now, I believe there are at least three important points in 2 Timothy 2.15 that actually merit our attention. The first thing would be Paul said study. Now, in contrast to this word, we find that, that it's prevalent today uh, and uh, appalling just how much ignorance of the Bible there is. It's reported that recently a, a, a school teacher asked class the question, what is an epistle? Well, hesitantly, a boy raised his hand and said, uh, I'm not sure. He faltered, but isn't an epistle the wife of an apostle? Well, now this illustrates a growing condition in our society. and. I fear that uh, it, it even takes place within the church. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the solution for this? Paul's words, they hold the answer. It's to study. The second thing that we want to look at and need to keep in consideration is the object of our study is clearly pointed out by Paul. You know, it's, a, it's the word of truth. You see, besides God's inspired word, all other books pale in, and are insignificant. Do, um, what we need to do is undo uh, the study of profane writings that will tend to produce profane and vain babblings, which Paul warns against in the next verse in 2 Timothy 2.16. God's word uh, must be followed as it's written. And God's word uh, must be the object of our uh, finest mental efforts our most reverent, prayerful attitude. God's word is all important. It's the only way we know how to please him. It's the only way we can live a life that will get us to heaven. Now, third, Paul's words suggest the right method of study, rightly dividing the word of truth or handling a right the word of truth. In the original language, the thought is literally cutting straight. From this, we see that the Christian's study is to be accurate, to be concise, 
And as a result of, of proper handling of God's word, you'll be able to do this. The use of this method will result in an ability to see the truth clearly and to present it with an exactness which can't be gainsaid. gainsaid. Nobody can stand against it if it's done properly. Now, this question here is the one I want to ask you. How does one rightly divide the Bible? Well, to rightly divide the scriptures, one needs to understand that there are three periods of time. These periods of time are recorded in God's word. The first period, called the patriarchal dispensation, began with Adam and extended through Exodus 19. During this period, God dealt with each family separately through the father, the head of the family, who would act as a mediator between the Lord and that particular family. The second period is what we call the Mosaic Dispensation. It began with the giving of the law at Mount Sinai in Exodus 20, and it continued until Christ died on the cross. During this time, the priesthood was changed from the head of the family to the house of Aaron and the tribe of Levi. There was two, of course, uh, uh, a, cha a change of the law. So God gave that law through Moses for the purpose of governing his chosen people, the Israelites. The Lord had as its, as, as, the law, excuse me, the law had as its purpose also the bringing of the people, uh, people to Christ. In other words, it served as a preparatory step in God's great scheme of human redemption. And you can find that in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24. You see, when Christ died, the purpose of Moses' law was fulfilled and therefore was abolished and taken out of the way. Colossians 2.13-17 through 17 tells us this. Romans 7, 1-6 explains it. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13 uh, it, it explains it clearly. You see, despite the fact that God's word is so crystal clear on this point, one of the most frequent mistakes made today is the failure to recognize the distinction between the Old and New Testaments. If all men understood that the old law has been annulled or done away with, we would never hear questions like these. David used mechanical instruments and music, so why can't we? Or what about the thief on the cross? Can't I be saved like he was saved? You see, either of these questions and many similar ones can be answered very simply. Both David and the thief lived on the other side of the cross. We live on the, this side of the cross, the, the side of the cross where Christ has already died and given us his new will or his new testament. You see, when they were alive, Christ's law was not in effect. Hebrews 9, 16, and 17 tell us this. Today, his law, Christ's law, is in effect. We then must adhere strictly to the last will and testament of Christ in all matters of faith and practice. What would your attitude be toward the man who endeavored to thwart or alter or in any way tamper with the will of a deceased friend. Would you allow that to happen? Well, no, and we shouldn't allow that to happen to Christ's testament either. Such action is uh, repelling to people who, who think properly, who think right. And yet, that's the very thing that some are trying to do to the, to the, that they want to destroy this greatest of all wills and testaments, the New Testament, to make it say or do what they want and mingle the Old and the New Testament together in a manner that is against what God says. The Old Testament merits our careful study. 
I will not challenge that one bit. Romans 15, 4 and 1 Corinthians 10, 11 explain this. But when we look at it today as authority and seek to justify ourselves by it, we fall from God's favor. Read Galatians chapter uh, 5 and verse 4. You see, the Savior's death on the cross ushered in a new period of time the one in which you and I are now living. The governing law of this period, of, of course, is the will of Christ. If we are to understand this spiritual law, it's imperative that we rightly divide our New Testament. The 27 books in the New Testament are divided into four natural divisions. They are one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Two, the book of Acts. Three, the letters written to Christians and Romans, uh, in Romans through Jude. And four, the book of Revelation. Matthew, through John, the first division, contains the life of Christ. This section was written mainly to convince men that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the Messiah of the Old Testament prophecy. John 20, chapter thir uh, verses 30 and 31 explain this. If every infidel in the world out here would read and study these four books, there would be a great reduction in the number of people who are misled and, and, and misguided. These books contain am ample evidence to move thoughtful men to believe in the divinity of Jesus. As we study these books, we need to understand that they describe a period prior to the establishment of the New Testament church. For that reason, we find that Christ worshiped on the Sabbath day, and kept the other aspects of the law since the law was in force until the day he died. Now, don't forget this. Whatever he spoke by way of uh, difference from the old law was to be included in the gospel to be preached after his ascension. The second division now of the New Testament is composed of only one book, and that would be the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Immediately after its first scenes, we read about the establishment of the church in Acts chapter 2. From then on, through the book, we have all the early history of the newly built church, and we are, are made to see that men, what men did in order to become members of that church. The book of Acts contains basically the blueprint by which Christians are made, and the one who is earnestly seeking an answer to the questions, what must I do to be saved, must carefully study the book of Acts. Now there are 21 books, Romans through Jude, that make up the next division of the New Testament. These letters of Paul, James, Peter, and John, and Jude are written to tell Christians how to live. It's a blueprint for our lives. Notice one book, the book of Acts, was written dealing with specifically with how man is to be saved uh, in, from his sins, and uh, 21 books uh, that are included in the New Testament to teach saints how to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Oh, how we need our teaching to be emphasized on these areas. We need to emphasize essenti uh, essentiality of pure, zealous living on the part of the Christian. I know men who never get out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They will not go to the epistles. 
to save their souls because the epistles will actually show them to be wrong in their teachings and they can't have that now in the final division of the new Te uh, of the new testament the book of revelations we here kept catch a glimpse of the eternal city of god and in this book the aged apostle john from the isle of patmos saw the heavens opened and viewed the things that uh, the redeemed shall someday experience as man reads this final book in God's word, the mind begins to turn to the glorious possibilities of that future world. That's where all our hopes are, are, are hanging. We're hanging all our hopes and all our, uh, all our being on the fact that we followed the 21 books that teach us how to live so that when we do end up either uh, passed away or the Lord comes again we're prepared and the book of revelations can give you uh, a, a good picture of this and it actually if you think about it and you read it carefully it gives you a very bright outlook you know with the reading uh, uh, of this book it's like a, a preview of that home of the soul and the joy that's never going to fade. You see, near the close of the Bible, uh, of this final chapter, of this final book, we find these words. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Revelations chapter 20 and verse 12. So when we stand in the, that great and crucial day to be weighed in the balance of God's eternal truth, how hopeless will our eternity be if we haven't lived the proper life? What if we fail to study and to rightly divide the word of the Lord? What is, what, what is going to be our end uh, destination? There's only two. You either will end up eternally in hell or eternally in heaven. And my friends, where I want to be is in heaven. Now, all of this, when you rightly divide the word and apply God's word, all you can think of, if you're doing properly, is how indescribable the joys will be that await you and me. Now, I've given you here a good sense of how to rightly divide God's word. But folks, you have to keep it, when, when you're reading, it's just like if you were a child. When you were, when you were a child, you were taught to um, ask the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, the how, all of that. And you have to do that same thing with the Bible. You have to be able to learn to keep within the context and not just pick and choose what you want, want out of it. So when you sit down and you start reading your Bible, ask yourself, well, who is this written to? Why was it written? Where was it written? Who wrote it? And how does it apply to you? Yes, there are some things in the Bible that do not apply to you, such as being able to do miracles, such as speaking in tongues and things like that. None of that applies to us today because it was done away with. That has ceased. But there is so much within the pages of the New Testament that will, will and should draw you to Christ. And just so that you know, in order to be in Christ, you have to hear, you have to believe, you have to confess, you have to repent, then you have to be baptized. And I used to use the term that it's kind of like a recipe. You leave out one ingredient, 
and you don't have what you're looking for. And too many people want to leave out baptism. Too many people want to leave out uh, confession or whatever they want to say, a sinner's prayer and go on. Well, it doesn't work that way. So please pick up your Bibles and rightly divide them. So I'm going to leave you with this today. I want to thank you for being here. And as always, there is a transcript on my website with uh, everything that I've taught here today broken down for you. My email address is at the top if you ever want to email me uh, so that you have uh, a, a way to converse with me. Uh, it's always at the top of the, uh, of the transcript. And for now, I'm going to let you ponder what we've just studied. So with that being said, may God bless and may you have a great day.